Good morning, everyone. So I, I was very pleased uh, to have the uh, cup of coffee with Tina uh, a number of months ago um, because uh, I really uh, welcome the opportunity to uh, contribute to, to this conference. Um, as was already mentioned this morning, it, it's very important that the financial sector engages with the uh, sustainability agenda, and I'll come back to that uh, in a minute or two. Uh, let me also say that you know, the central bank uh, itself, uh, in terms of our own new building, uh, the transformation of the central bank, we've very much benefited from the guidance of business in the community in developing our own corporate social responsibility and sustainability activities. Uh, in advance, uh, let me congratulate the, the, the companies that will be awarded here today with the business working responsibly mark. Uh, I think there's no substitute for having independent accreditation based on a comprehensive set of criteria. And I, I know this because we are also looking at this, and I think we're going to try to uh, see if we can uh, attain the mark uh, next year. And we're working through those criteria now. So let me uh, try to do two things in the uh, time I, I have. Uh, along one perspective, I want to talk about the interaction between the financial system and sustainability, uh, and especially the role of the central bank uh, uh, along that dimension. And then second, um, I, I also want to talk about how the central bank as an individual institution is uh, addressing this agenda. Let me also say, by the way, um, you know, what, what I'm going to talk about is a little bit narrow uh, compared to um, uh, what we just heard about, because of course financing um, for sustainability includes a, a very large public component in terms of the public investment requirements for sustainable infrastructure, and also in terms of uh, th there's really uh, an essential role for uh, international aid, so cross-border transfers. Again, uh, the private sector can do a lot, but it's not going to do everything. So. Those public dimensions are, are for uh, other, other uh, contributors to, to talk about. Okay, so let me first of all address the issue about how the financial system can support sustainability. And uh, let me, uh, you know, address the first question you might have is, what does this have to do with central banking? So Mark Carney, uh, you know, that was a, he has made striking contributions but there was a lot of uh, question marks about you know, what exactly is the mandate of a central bank? Why is a central bank dealing with this kind of topic? Now, I think there are good answers to that, which I'm going to come to. Now, one basic answer is a precondition for uh, implementing strategic long-term policies that can support sustainability. A basic precondition is uh, stability of the macro-financial system. So at both domestic and international levels, the basic lesson that we all painfully uh, learned during the boom-bust cycle between 03 and 09, the European sovereign debt crisis between 2010 and 2012, and what we've, we've seen in terms of the very slow and adjust, protracted adjustment uh, uh, dynamic since then, is essentially a lot of time and effort and attention can be diverted to short-term issues if the financial system becomes unstable. So that, that's uh, for several reasons. One is, during periods of instability, there's uncertainty about the future path for the economy. And if we don't know where we're going in terms of the potential of the economy, it's very difficult for decision makers, whether private decision makers or public decision makers, to work out what is the sustainable path for investment, for example. Second, at a basic level, the, uh, financial crises are very costly in terms of the uh, fiscal position, so that uh, if we have financial crises, it's going to divert resources from uh, investing in long-term uh, targets. Uh, a basic issue is bandwidth, that if, if all of the energy of the political system is absorbed with crisis management, then there's less left over in terms of the ability to focus on long-term issues. Uh, another basic issue is boom-bust cycles are very wasteful of resources. To take an obvious example, the history of the construction sector in Ireland over the last 15 years provides a case study of how untamed credit can, can contribute to severe misallocation resources, 
both across time and across geographies in terms of the inappropriate locations, non-sustainable locations for housing, for example. So that's a pretty basic, uh, you might think a little bit boring, uh, contribution the central bank can make, which is only through uh, you know, tying down financial stability can the uh, investment community, can the wider policy community focus on sustainability. So how do we do this? Well, uh, we have uh, what we call micro-prudential instruments and macro-prudential. So the micro tools we have are uh, capital ratios, liquidity ratios on individual firms, uh, which is backed up by intensive supervision and inspections. At the macro level, uh, the infrastructure now means that we can uh, impose additional capital buffers and risk rates uh, in recognition of systemic risk factors. In addition, we have borrower-based measures such as loan-to-income, loan-to-value ceilings in relation to mortgages in order to uh, prevent collective overborrowing by households. So these days, uh, you're going to see uh, last week or the week before, we, we announced what, what are called OC buffers. So OC means other systemically important institutions. And we list out a number of firms in Ireland which, because they're so systemically important, have to hold more capital uh, to guard against downturns. Uh, another instrument that we now look at every 90 days, every three months, is called the counter-cyclical capital buffer, the CCYB, which essentially is there if we detect this starting to be overheating in the credit cycle, this can be raised. Uh, and that's kind of an early intervention to limit the risks of excessive credit. Now, so far, we haven't uh, pushed that trigger yet because credit in Ireland remains subdued in the aggregate. Although there's new lending going on, uh, a lot of households, a lot of firms are still just paying down old debt. So on, in the aggregate, credit is not particularly strong at the moment. Having said that, uh, across Europe, more and more countries are starting to push the button on the counter cyclical capital buffer, and I think we will be looking at that very closely in, in the coming years. Uh, by the way, uh, another dimension of maintaining financial stability is what we call recovery and resolution regimes. So we know during the crisis here and elsewhere, one basic contagion factor was trying to keep open banks that should have been shut down. Now, at the time, the bankruptcy regimes didn't allow for us to shut down uh, banks in a safe, uh, stable manner. Now we have that regime uh, designed, and uh, it's increasingly been implemented, and that's going to be important in the future. So here in Ireland, we're the National Resolution Authority, and we work uh, with the EU-level Single Resolution Board for the larger institutions. So, you know, step one is essentially only through maintaining stability can sustainability be uh, a proper focus. Let me now turn uh, more broadly to what are the implications of environmental sustainability for the financial system. So, at a general level, a basic function of the financial system is to allocate resources to expanding sectors and withdraw resources from contracting sectors. Now, this is easiest if structural change unfolds at a gradual pace. So natural adjustment mechanisms can uh, facilitate the decline of unsustainable sectors and support the expansion of sustainability-enhancing sectors. So the, uh, the glide adjustment model uh, is easiest to support. However, if there's a sudden uh, shift in economic and financial structures, this is going to be much more disruptive in terms of the capacity of the financial system to absorb losses on loans and investments in uh, entities that require restructuring or outright bankruptcy. So this basic calculus is relevant in assessing the implications for the financial system of adapting to lower carbon intensity. A gradual transition is feasible if there are sufficient early policy interventions to set the world economy on a clear path towards a sustainable future. Alternatively, if adjustment is delayed 
By the same logic, there's going to be an elevated risk of sudden and disruptive shift in carbon intensity at some point in the future. So you have a basic choice. We basically have a choice as, as a global society about gradual and steady versus delayed and sudden. Now, in the delayed and sudden uh, scenario, this is going to have adverse consequences for the financial system. But let me emphasize through two mechanisms. One is through direct exposures to carbon intensive firms, um, which could suddenly, suddenly lose value, lose viability. But more broadly, if the world has been asked to make a sudden shift uh, in terms of its carbon mix, uh, that's going to lead to a pretty significant recession. So on the supply side, the productive capacity of the world economy is going to be compromised if carbon intensive technologies have to be switched off very quickly. And on the demand side, the, this scenario of a sudden disruptive uh, transition will, will lead to a pullback of investment and consumption. So whether you're a firm that's directly lending or investing in carbon intensive sectors, you're at risk but basically the whole system is at risk from the wider recessionary impact. So, uh, you know, uh, no one is safe in that scenario. So, given that risk factor, a, a very basic building block uh, was already mentioned, which is climate-related financial disclosures, and more broadly, uh, the logic of disclosing other types of non-financial exposure. So this is why the Financial Stability Board, which is essentially a global platform for financial regulation uh, sponsored the task force which is chaired by Mike Bloomberg and which released its final set of rec recommendations this summer. And the basic message from the task force is that it is essential for firms to make consistent climate related financial risk disclosures. Um, so let me emphasize consistency. There's all sorts of initiatives around the world about disclosures. But if people are using def different definitions different criteria and so on, it's very inefficient in terms of working out which firms uh, are most at risk. Uh, so number one, uh, only if firms make these disclosures can the financial system make risk assessments in terms of uh, lending decisions, investing decisions. And for us as regulators, uh, in order for to work out the systemic risks, for example, to stress testing carbon exposures, we, know we need that basic information. Now, it's, uh, the task force is just one example. I think the central banking community has been a leader in uh, working and publishing on these financial risks, whether in relation to banks, in relation to insurance companies, and so on. So uh, let me uh, you know, remind you of the important work done by the Bank of England and the Prudential Regulatory Authority in the UK. At a European level, and I was involved myself in this work, the European Systemic Risk Board has published on, on, on these climate-related issues. Uh, and more broadly, uh, there's a lot of activity in the financial regulatory community to prepare for the carbon transition. You know, no prediction about when any of these risks may materialize, uh, but we, we have to be prepared. Let me also emphasize that such disclosures are also important in guiding the asset allocation decisions of end investors. Uh, and end investors care for two reasons. One is, even if you don't care about the environment, you may recognize it's a material uh, financial risk factor um, if you're exposed to climate risk. Uh, but more broadly, there is a, you know, um, here we are talking about the role of firms, but I think more broadly around the world, there's plenty of evidence that more and more end investors, um, uh, institutions on behalf of households, wealthy individuals, wealthy families, do want to be assured that the investments they make respect environmental, social, and governance criteria. So this ESG asset class is clearly uh, rising in importance, and I'm, I'm guessing Rick, Rick may come back to this uh, later on. So I think, uh, as I mentioned, really, that uh, this, this is a bottom line issue for many firms. It's a bottom line issue for regulators. Uh, and, you know, there's no uh, going back on this. It's, it's, it's now totally embedded uh, in, in how we work and how we think about the future because uh, it's such a clear and obvious trigger factor. Carbon is a common global risk factor, and, uh, you know, we'd be very remiss if we did not uh, try and uh, address that. Now, um, 
I, the clock tells me I have five minutes. So uh, let me try and little, uh, give you a little bit of a flavour of our own work at the central bank. So this is a bit of a gear shift to much more local and uh, individual. Um, now, why should you care about the central bank's own work? Well, number one, as the regulator of 10,000 firms, I think we do have a, a kind of leadership or demonstration effect for the firms in the financial sector. Um, so, you know, we, we are conscious of that uh, role model type, type uh, perspective. And second, of course, we've just moved. We've moved uh, down to a new building in North Wall Quay. And it, the opportunity of moving to a new building, of course, allowed us to make sure, well, let's step forward in a good way, not just in terms of the design of the building, but we have a, a kind of related set of changes in how we work uh, and other types of uh, uh, dimensions of the overall uh, CSR and sustainability agenda. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think uh, we are quite happy with our new building. Uh, in July, it received the Royal Institute of Architects Universal Design Award. Uh, we, we, uh, those involved in the design, uh, Heavily, uh, we're focused on making sure it's 100% green, renewable in terms of energy usage. And for a building of the size, the uh, BER rating of A2 is, I think, uh, uh, quite, quite, quite exceptional. Let me emphasize uh, the original building, which was intended for the mother institution, whose name I've forgotten, uh, was a, a C3 rating. So the difference between C3 to uh, A2 is about a 70% uh, saving in terms of energy usage. And uh, our commitment is to make an energy saving target of 33% by 2020, which is in line with the National Energy Efficiency Action Plan for the public sector. Um, now, the way we work, at the same time as moving to new building, we change our technologies. And essentially now, uh, people have much, uh, uh, much more mobile technology, uh, big emphasis on avoiding, you know, it's not totally possible. Uh, I've got a printed speech this morning, for example, but uh, we, we do try and uh, cut down on printing, and so far, in the first number of months, it's come down by about a quarter, which is a decent start, but I wouldn't say it's, it's it. Let me emphasize, and, you know, whenever you have a quiet evening, you may want to click on yourself, is historically, if you wanted to consult our archives, you'd have to come in uh, with limited access, now we've put a, a, you know, a very extensive catalogue on the web. So again, that's um, uh, much, uh, it's a good, I think, uh, social uh, initiative and saves people, provides much more accessibility for that. Uh, we now have a new visitor centre, so in terms of opening up to the public, uh, it's, it's a much more open building. Um, and we have, you know, I think, very interesting uh, exhibit, exhibits in the visitor centre, which is open every day. Uh, through Culture Night and Open House, we've also had many people coming through in recent months. Uh, but probably the most effective uh, outreach initiative we do is every year we go to the National Ploughing Championships. And that's uh, just such a, a, an amazing way to, to uh, connect with so many people. Let me emphasize also in terms of um, the, the work of the bank is, uh, is mentioned earlier on in terms of diversity and inclusion. And this is absolutely an area that we, we think the dual role of, of our institution is important. So within the bank, this is very much a priority in terms of our, our own uh, em, em, uh, workforce, in terms of the way we uh, conduct business ourselves. But absolutely, the evidence is really strong in the financial sector that you know, it's not just correct on its own terms, but having diversity in, among senior decision makers uh, we think the evidence is compelling in terms of leading to better decision making. Uh, and then let me just finally conclude is, uh, I think I mentioned at the start that essentially sustainability requires private finance, it requires public finance, it requires international aid. Um, and equally in terms of the, the role of the, uh, our, our own uh, uh, staff, uh, we would recognize that it'd be an incomplete way of working just to uh, work for the central bank's agenda. So we're very pleased that we have a staff-led charity committee that partners with a number of charities in terms of fund fundraising and outreach. And our staff members are all, you know, a, a good number of volunteer with initiatives such as Early Learning Initiative and Junior Achievement Ireland in terms of the link to the uh, local schools in particular. 
So, uh, you know, this again is a party for its own value, but we would fully recognize, as I mentioned earlier on, in terms of investors embracing the ESG agenda, it's absolutely the case, it's noticeable in our recruitment that uh, the you know, workers looking to see, well, where can I work, especially in a tight labor market, as we've seen here, really place, place a heavy premium on working for firms that they can be proud of in terms of their CSR uh, commitment. So we're very pleased uh, to, to pursue that. We're very pleased to be part of this uh, community this morning, and uh, I look forward to the rest of today's uh, 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 program. Thank you very much.